Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 56. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's Laura Reagan, LCSWC, with today's episode. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. This is your host, Laura Reagan, and today is a continuation of the conversation I had with you last week about my experience finding a heart and soul connection in a barn. The connection was really with myself and the horse, but really it was myself. And it was such a special and magical experience one that I'd been wanting to try for a while, especially after I interviewed the guest who you're going to hear from today, Charlotte Heiler Easley, LCSW, who is a therapist practicing equine assisted psychotherapy in Lexington, Kentucky. And she created a model called equine assisted survivors of trauma therapy E-A-S-T-T. And I admire Charlotte so much because like me, she's a warrior in the fight to end sexual violence. And she's so passionate and knowledgeable about working with horses. And so I'm excited to share our interview with you today. You're going to hear Charlotte talk about how horses are able to read our body language and react to what we're saying with our nonverbal signals, including when we're triggered or when we're having some kind of emotional experience, and how equine-assisted psychotherapy, EAP for short, can help survivors of trauma to regulate their affect. I think this episode is a must-listen for people who've experienced trauma to maybe get a little bit more in touch with how some of the sensations and feelings that you may have felt in your body or you may have noticed and experienced but didn't know what to call it. Um, She kind of describes a lot of that in this episode. So Charlotte talks about how she came to develop EAST the Equine Assisted Survivors of Trauma Therapy Method. She gives information on what equine therapy is and talks about the two major certification groups, EGALA and PATH. She explains how she helps therapists use equine assisted practices in their work and she consults with therapists on this as well. She talks about how the experiential nature of this work allows trauma survivors to safely practice different ways of being in relationship and feel how it feels to practice that, not just talk about it. She explains a lot about how we use equine assisted therapy to regulate our affect, our bodies and our minds and get connected with that mind body connection. She talks about how grounding is used in this work, how EAP can help challenge cognitive distortions and beliefs about ourselves and how that can change things in our relationships, how it supports setting and trying out different ways of setting and enforcing boundaries, listening to our bodies, and being in the present moment. Practicing feeling safe and listening to what our bodies are telling us for survivors of sexual assault. This is something that can be extremely powerful. She finishes up our interview by talking about an upcoming retreat she's holding for trauma therapists in Lexington. 
and gives you information on how to get in touch with her. I am really pleased to share my interview with Charlotte Hyler Easley, LCSW, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC, and today I'm super excited because I have a wonderful guest to interview. Charlotte Hyler Easley, LCSW, is a clinical social worker and an equine specialist in mental health and learning. I am so excited about what Charlotte is going to discuss. So let's dive right in. Charlotte, thank you so much for being here. Laura, thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited. What got me interested in wanting to interview you is you were talking about your work with equine assisted survivors of trauma therapy. And as you know, I'm a trauma therapist myself. So I was like, how does working with horses and working with trauma survivors, I can see how it might fit together, but I wanted to hear from you about how you do that work. I think it sounds incredible. It is pretty incredible. And um, I think part of the issues with explaining this is that it is so experiential. So uh, I'll do my best to try to create a picture of what it is, but I just want to encourage everyone to get out and uh, experience it. Charlotte, can you talk a little bit about what you do in your work? When our youngest graduated uh, from college, I went back to school. I had a real heart to work with women. And in out of that ended up as a therapist at a rape crisis center, and which was an incredible experience because they pour in trauma informed care and they they really taught me about how to provide that for people. The other place that I had done an internship was uh, at Central Kentucky Riding for Hope here in Lexington, which is and it's at the horse park. And I always understood about animals and solace and animals and grounding. I've had a therapy dog for, uh, for the last 15 years. He's retired now, but so I wanted to take that piece to the horses and see what we came up with. And the neurobiology, the science pieces on trauma is just yelling at us to start recognizing that mind body connection. So it all just came together wonderfully. And um, we took an old curriculum that the Rape Crisis Center had used before that was successful. And what I did then um, is sort of for my capstone, my thesis while I was in graduate school is created a curriculum that incorporated the horse activities and the horse relationship. So our East group, which is six years now, the Red Crisis Center has decided it's integral to the healing process. Um, so they, it's no longer just a fuzzy add-on because we've seen so much success and so much shift and our clients just love it. So um, they've sought funding for it. So we're able to offer it twice a year free to um, survivors from the Red Crisis Center. What has grown out of that Part of my private practice now is consulting for creation of trauma-informed equine programming and working with other agencies or other therapists who are looking to bring this piece into their practice. And also out of that, I also do individual equine-assisted psychotherapy, uh, which is exactly the same as a traditional therapy setting, except we're meeting in the barn. We're still working on therapy goals. We're still have, working out of a treatment plan, but we're doing that in partnership with a horse. Okay, so I have so many questions. <laughs> First, a practical question is, if you meet at the barn, is it your barn or do you go to uh, just a horse farm where you you have some kind of arrangement with them? Well, and I think that's the thing is that pe- different people do different things. Right now, what I do is I work out of a therapeutic riding center mm. that is really, I'm so blessed to be there. Um, it's really a state of the art type of facility. And we have a lot of different horses to work with. 
Charlotte, let's back up a little bit. Let me just ask you first to explain a little bit more about what is equine-assisted psychotherapy? If you could explain that for our audience who may not be familiar. Equine-assisted psychotherapy is all non-mounted work. It's all side-by-side with a horse. It's about relationship. It's not about horsemanship. Horses are so good for trauma work and really for any work, but especially for trauma. We know that relationship and that connection piece is something that trauma survivors often need to re-experience in a healthy way. And horses are, uh, they, they are relational. They are prey animals, which means they've been hunted since the beginning of time. So we are, humans are predators. The horses as prey animals, they're finely attuned to their environment. They're hardwired to be curious in order to keep themselves safe. But they also are just responding to our interior landscape when we get close to them. They live in a herd. The herd has protected them. That's their that's their group. So when we partner with a horse, we basically become the herd. So the prey mindset is their survival is dependent on that and the herd behavior. So they live in the moment, and what they pay attention to is. Do I feel safe when I'm with them? What equine-assisted psychotherapy or equine-assisted learning, when we're doing that, one of the very first things that I do is we do herd observation. And we will walk out, and a big part of that is starting to bring our minds online and to bring in that mindfulness piece and calm all that reactivity down. There's lots of models out there for certification for equine assisted work and therapy programs. And there's coaching and leadership programs, and they're all really powerful. And I believe that's part of the experiential approach really helps people learn things and practice things that and creates new self-awareness about body language, about what it means to feel safe, and let that mask sort of come down. And the one thing I do want to say, if a therapist wants to look for a program that you can get online and look there, both PATH and EGALA have providers of service. So if you're a therapist looking for an ES in a program, you can go on there and find somebody and start talking to them about creating that team. Because most of the work that we do is in a team perspective. So we will have an equine specialist who is someone who knows the horse behavior, who knows, um, is watching to keep the horses safe and the people safe. And then we have the therapist who, if you're doing trauma-informed care, that is a really important piece, someone who's trained in resourcing and grounding and, and really skilled around the process of reprocessing. So if your client looking for these services, you can get online with both of those and look for someone in your area also. So EAP is basically about holding space for people. And there's a gal named Heather Platt who spoke recently at a, a an EGALA conference, and she talked about that we're, we're just creating a bowl. And I think for Therapists, lots of times when we come to EAP, it's very hard for us to get the idea of being very decentered. That when we throw the horse in there as a sentient, huge presence with the client, that that is the focus and we're just there to facilitate it. So being the bowl means that you're not the fork. <laughs> and, you know, really. It's about the client's experience and what comes up for them as their work with the horse. And when we start inserting ourselves in there, we are changing what their experience is. So we're there and we are constant. We're setting up and facilitating rather than being an actual participant in the session is in traditional therapy in an office. When we're working with the horses, we have a treatment plan. We have treatment goals. I'm certified as an equine specialist and a therapist, so I can work with other therapists or 
I have an equine specialist who comes to work with me when I'm serving it for the therapist. And it's just really based on creating awareness through experiencing different things. Horses give us this great in the moment feedback and they, and out of that, we get to either make the choice to adjust what we're doing or just become aware of it so that we can notice how it's affecting our surroundings. Because chances are if something's coming up with the horse when I'm working with him doing an activity or whether it's walking him from the paddock to the barn and he reacts to something, the chances are it's something that's within me or what I'm bringing with my body language and that I'm congruent, uh, that my head and my body are kind of in the same place. So we have people all the time that have really a lot of anxiety, be in that hyper aroused place for something will come into the environment in the barn and will cause them to sort to be triggered. And so immediately their anxiety goes up, their, you know, their heart rate goes up, all of these physical things happen, but they're also just feeling all this stuff and they cannot get that front part of their brain back online. And we talk about this all the time. What part of your brain are you in? Where are you? Okay, we need you to come back in here. Now look, and we start doing the grounding. Count the post, count the count the buckets over there. What color are the buckets? You know, and to bring people down. But most of the time the the horse is already reacting to them before we may even notice what's going on and that they may be triggered. And he will do something, you know, he may just start moving his feet a little bit, or he may start flinging his head, or he may start walking away if he's loose, or he may come in and check on them. And um, that's their signal. Okay, so something's going on with me. And then if they are in the basic very first stages of work, we're going to help them develop the skills and they get to practice um, in a real time setting, which is when they go to the grocery store, they don't always get that. But out there it is safe and the whole, they can gain that awareness and then practice some things that can really facilitate them getting back into their lives. Yeah, so I have a question about this. Sure. So when, if I'm right, and please tell me if I'm wrong, um, when people are with a horse, the horse is sensing what's happening with the person, right? Like you said. And mm -hmm. so the horse may sense that the person is triggered when this person is not sensing it. Right, right. So back to that neurobiology of trauma piece that our bodies know things, you know, they're, they're holding on to those, um, those implicit memories, right? Right. So things, things start happening and lots of times the head is two steps behind or because, you know, we may be a little checked out, a little dissociated, a little, or we may be, you know, way, up and being active in our heads and um, horses because they are prey animals they and they have a hyper attunement to their environment that keeps them safe and they rely on this herd behavior um, to determine whether they're safe and they're very skilled at reading what's going on with their herd um, to small small changes in uh, um, head, where the head is, you know, in a herd. If the head goes up, somebody's saw, seen something. And so we all need to look at that and see what that is and see if mm. it's a threat or not. And if it's a threat, then we have to make, you know, they're going to make a choice sort of whether they're going to fight or flee. Or if they decide that it's not a threat, then they're going to go back to what they're doing. Whereas with us, right, we're going to decide it's not a threat. Log logically, we know it's not a threat. But in the back of our brains, we're going, oh, but, I, you know, it feels and we're all we can't let go of it. Yeah. Right? And we're, we're all dysregulated, it, right? Right. And we're we're there for hours until we consciously understand that we can bring in some of our resources and bring ourselves back online. So, um 
So the horse is very attuned. So when something sort of triggers someone, their body may react um, a loud sound in the arena, right? Mm -hmm. Their body may jump. So the horse is going to go, whoop, what is this? And as our brains catch up with our bodies, we're going to go, oop, don't feel safe, don't feel safe. And we'll either, you know, whatever our we're going to shut down or we're going to want to run or all those symptoms are going to come up. And then it's obvious. Uh, But the horse has already sensed that something's changed and they're going to react to that. So the person has, has practice in um, noticing, we will say what just happened and what is your horse doing? Mm. And then not only are they noticing that, but they're, they have to become mindful and in the moment present with that, which brings helps bring them back online and helps regulate that process a little bit. So does that all make sense? <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it's, I mean, I have this sense and I'm not sure if I'm right, because again, I don't really know that much about this, but I've kind of got this sense that if I walk into an arena to work with a horse And I'm filled with anxiety. The Mm -hmm. horse is going to sense something's wrong. And then Mm -hmm. I have to use my own body to calm my body so that the horse will relax. Is that right? Yes, it is. Now, some horses will walk off. Some horses will come. And we've actually seen some horses walk up to people and put their nose against someone's chest as if to say, are you okay? You know, of course that's my, (laughs) my interpretation, but they're, they actually come up and make connection with people, a physical connection with people. And that can be a really powerful experience. So horses, they have their own personality. They have good and bad days they are going to take care of themselves. That's one of the things that I think is really powerful for trauma survivors is that they get to watch horses take care of themselves. So for instance, if we're working with a horse in in the round pen and that's just a circle, a fence that's set up in a circle and the horse may be loose in there and we're we're standing in in this space so we'll just, you can take him off his lead now whenever you feel safe. And if the horse follows them, that's a, that's a big deal. If the horse walks away, then lots of times survivors of trauma are feeling like rejection. Mm-hmm. I've been rejected again. I knew I wasn't enough. I knew this was wrong. I know I'm damaged. And so we get to challenge that directly by saying, what what did your horse do? He walked away from me. Okay, why did he walk away from you? What is he doing now? And lots of times he's gone over to get a drink of water. Mm-hmm. And we get to say, now, did he, you know, and they're going, but he doesn't like me. And we can say, you know what? He doesn't really have that piece of his brain where he gets to plot and plan against you or choose whether he likes you or not. He is just taking care of himself. So we we explain about horse behavior so that people have a clear picture and they can start challenging some of those negative cognitions that they have about themselves and what's happening in their world so that then they can gain a wider perspective when they're in relationship with people. And so they can, they'll come and they'll say, well, you know what really helped me this week is when my husband walked, turned and walked away after I was talking to him, instead of thinking that he was mad at me or that I had done something wrong, I just watched where he went and he went over to get a Coke out of the refrigerator and then he came right back. And so that felt really good. That felt powerful. So a lot of what happens in the equine work is is empowering to people. And they have choices. We're always careful. That's a trauma-informed piece. Always careful from the very beginning to the very end that they have a choice in how they approach the horse, what horse they work with. We always do herd observation at the beginning. 
And we walk to the fence and we watch a herd, which in itself is just a calming experience for a lot of people to be out in the country, to have a quiet place and to just sit without anything that's pushing on them or asking from them. There's no pressure to just watch. And we watch from that safe place. And then after a while, we'll say, if everybody feels safe enough, we're going to walk into the herd. And sometimes people will say, I need to wait, and and someone will stay behind, you know, one of the facilitators will stay with them, and the rest of us will walk in. And we're always checking, what is it that you feel like you want to do, right? What is your body, checking in with that body, uh, connecting that brain and that body. What does your body feel like it needs to do? It needs to walk up to this horse. Okay, so if you'd like to walk up to that horse and you feel safe doing that, then go right ahead. Our horses are very well trained. We trust them, but they are still horses, right? So they can still cause, they could turn and bite somebody. They could kick it a fly and accidentally hit somebody. But that's part of what, when we're working in these groups, especially the survivors of trauma group, we make people aware of that. And we don't give them a whole bunch of rules that scare them to death. We just say, you know, horses are big. They have big feet. You need to be aware of your space. You need to be aware of where you're standing. And That's usually all we have to say. Now, occasionally they'll get between their horse and a fence or something too close, and we will ask them, do you feel safe right now? And maybe they've gone offline for a little bit, and they'll go, oh, actually, no. Okay, so what do you need to do to get safe? And they have the power to move these horses. And for people who have had all their power taken from them, it is a whole new body language and a whole new way of experiencing life to be able to ask for something and have have someone come along beside you and do what you're asking them to do with these huge horses. And I think that for a lot of our survivors, it, that is one of the most empowering pieces that we see. Wow. it's I can just picture it. I mean, I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think the piece, and you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, as a therapist in trauma, working with trauma therapy, one of the places that I really love to do work is with trauma therapists. I think there's so much about being in this environment that helps us release and and hold that space for those stories in a healthier way because one we're outdoors we have a bigger space number two we're decentered right i think the power is that the horse gets to help us hold the story and the horse gets to help us do the work so it, it It is hard work for our horses, and sometimes we turn them out, and they go run and jump and kick and buck and and push other horses around to release some of that tension. And sometimes when we turn them out and we walk toward the gate, they follow us because they're wanting to not leave that piece. They're, They're joined up with us in a sense. So it's interesting work, and I think for trauma providers, And we work with, I do a lot of training with trauma providers to let them experience this. It's so resourcing and it's so freeing to sort of let go of some of that stuff in our bodies that holds on to those pieces of the stories that we're working with. Yeah, you know, what you said about how um, the horses can help hold space and how it's about connection, you know, and I just thought how the isolation of, you know, holding stories that you can't share. Mm -hmm. And if you're well resourced, you can do that. But when you feel super saturated, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't have as much to give and how in connection with the horse, you know, your connection to me is an antidote to 
isolation, you know, I mean, obviously, it's probably not just to me. <laughs> but <laughs> You know, and I just picture the horse sort of silently, like a knowing, you know, like, yeah, we're, we're okay. Yeah. And they and they do. I think they, they will check to see, um, they will orient. And if they sense that something is incongruent with us or that something has happened, there's been a shift somewhere. Um, and if they determine, if we're working with other horses, if we're in a group and they determine that they're, the, the rest of the group still feels pretty safe, they're going to just say, okay, what's wrong with you? And can you, you know, check in with yourself? It's sort of that kind of a message mm. to people to that, oh, yeah, something is going on with me. Or, yeah, there has been a shift. And sometimes it's not a triggering shift. Sometimes it's just an opening of a piece of their story, the the client's story that just hasn't been able, they haven't been able to access yet, but because they've, they've experienced a connection with the horse or we've done an activity that created a metaphor for their experience and they have a new insight or a new perspective. It sometimes it, it sort of releases some of that story that needs to be expressed and, that can be very freeing, but it's also very emotional. Yeah. So when you and I were talking before we started the actual recording, you were telling me a little bit about how this work impacts clients. And, and you know, we're talking about what it does in the moment, but what's it like for people after they've done one of these groups or even after a session? How does it change things for them? I think the experiential nature of it and the power of the huge presence of the horse leave a lasting sort of a shadow of what has happened. And because we do use a lot of metaphor in, in the work, that that translates to their lives outside of the arena. And many times they will come back and say, I just noticed this week. It's just about building that self-awareness around things that are working and things that aren't working. And once you begin to be aware of things, you start noticing how it's showing up and then you get the choice to whether to, to decide to either change it or that it's part of you and you're going to set a boundary around it and other people are just going to be able have to accept that that's who you are, which happens. And when we're working with women who have sexual trauma, and all of my groups have been women, so far I do work with individual men, that 5149, we talk about 49% of the relationship belongs to the other person. 51% of it needs to belong to you. And that way, you are both respecting that you are individuals, that you have certain wants, needs, desires, dreams, ways of being, and we're going to make space for that in our relationship, and we're going to honor that, respect each other for being different. But I need to keep 1% of that at least in my favor so that I get to make choices about my safety and I get to make choices about how things play out for me. You get to hold 51% of it for yourself. And if it doesn't work for me, I get to choose whether or not to go along or not. And it's pretty powerful, I think, especially for women who've been in relationships that have been more like 80 20 mm -hmm. where the other partner has all the control and they have none or when they've been in even a 40 60 relationship that somebody's needs are not getting totally met or that someone is having some part of who they are neglected or pushed down and it's been really powerful um sort of a metaphor explanation 
for a dumping off point for when we're talking about how to have healthy relationships and how to set boundaries. We do a lot of boundary work. Yeah, I really like that. I haven't heard that before the 5149, but it totally makes sense to me. Each person is responsible for taking care of themselves that extra 1% above the other person taking care of their needs. Like, you know, you take care of yours, I take care of mine. And while you're taking care of yours, if that means something that I'm not comfortable with, and, you know, that's where I make the choice if I want to do that or not, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the reason you probably haven't heard of it before is because <laughs> it's part of our program. It's one of those concepts that we just kept seeing people not being able to understand that they had a right to make choices for themselves that kept themselves safe and that honored what their needs were and what even what their dreams were. If you know, and not only what they want needed, but what did they want and how to also honor other people and to look at themselves as separate entities, not one and the same, right? Yeah, that's very, very, very cool. Thank you for sharing that concept and, and talking about all of this. It's so fascinating. And I know you said you have a retreat for trauma therapist coming up in 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are having a two day retreat for trauma providers that will focus on creating self awareness around needs and self care around mindfulness, we'll be doing some yoga, some, some creative things, we'll be playing, actually, and sort of just reconnecting time time away and working with the horses so getting a first-hand experience lots and setting some goals or looking at some things some obstacles that might be in the way of moving into that place of self-care or of your dream for what your practice looks like or what your plans are for the future and how to incorporate a more balanced life how family and work and life and all those other things just come into the picture. Yeah, they do. Well, that sounds that retreat sounds beautiful. And where can people get more information about that retreat and all of your work? Um, I have a, a website and it's LexingtonWomensTherapy.com. I uh, also have a Facebook page that is Charlotte Hyler Easley, LCSW. Um, there's a work, uh, all the workshops will be listed on the uh, website and on the Facebook page. And, and also um, Central Kentucky Writing for Hope, which is the center where I do my work. They uh, have a Facebook page and we create events for our workshops there to Awesome. So I'll be sure that all these websites, both of these websites are linked in the show notes. And so people can easily find them. I think a lot of people who are listening are probably going to be really interested in getting more information. And I'm so grateful, Charlotte, to have talked to you today on Therapy Chat and learn more about your equine assisted survivors of trauma therapy model. And you and the beautiful things you're doing in the bluegrass state. I think it's so inspiring. And I'm really just so appreciative that you were able to give me your time today. Oh, well, thank you, Laura, for having me. Really uh, appreciate it. It is powerful. And it's such a growing field that I'm confident that if you can't find a provider, if you want to get in touch with me, I would be glad to uh, try to find someone for you to do the work or to partner with someone to um, create a team and to talk about the training. And also, if you are interested and have a place and you're looking to um, create some trauma-informed programming, I would lo- I, I'm free to talk to. Awesome. I, yeah. I didn't mean that cost was. <laughs> so. Yeah. Wait a minute. You're free. Okay. I'll, how much time you got? <laughs> no, but I meant I would, I'm just, I just love talking about it and I'd love to see, you know, people get involved with it because it is powerful and, 
and it's it it does change people's lives for the better. Yeah, I, I think it's beautiful. And I'm so glad you're there to help people experience this and find out more about it and teach therapists more about it and help us connect with this work. I think it's really great. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I thought that was a really fascinating interview, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Charlotte has so much to say about her work, and I was hanging on every word. I'm just fascinated with equine-assisted psychotherapy and my own experiences that I've had now with horses. Um, I can't wait to do more. I'll be reporting back about what happens when I go to an equine retreat for therapists soon, next couple weeks. Um, Spending more time with horses, I think it's going to be even more amazing. So thanks so much for listening to Therapy Chat today. I'd love to hear what you think. Please feel free to get in touch with me. You can visit the website, therapychatpodcast.com. And there's a way to contact me through that. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, visit Laura's website at www.lauraregan.lcswc.com.